everybody. Welcome to week seven of our Life Group video series, Three Chords Strong. My name is Howard. I'm the Alvin Campus Pastor, for those that don't know me. And last week, you know, Pastor Jeremy talked to us about the importance of forgiveness and grace in our relationships. And we're going to look at another key ingredient for cultivating successful relationships this week. Hopefully, you've been able to pick up some good, useful tools throughout our series as we've talked about things like communication and, and boundaries and peacemaking. As we've tried to unwrap throughout this series, our lives were not made to be lived in isolation or lived on our own. Listen to me. There's nothing heroic about going through life as an island. We need each other. That's the way God made us. We need community and we need relationships. To introduce our topic today, I, I want to look at a section of Scripture that we find in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. In it, we see Jesus being grilled by the religious leaders, and he's answering their questions. We pick it up in verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, Of all of the commandments, which is the most important? Now, if you don't know this, the, the, they, the Mosaic law had taken the original Ten Commandments and ballooned them to where well, there were actually 613 laws. There was a whole lot of you must do this, a whole lot of you must not do this. But what they did, the religious leaders, is they sit around all day long debating and arguing and trying to determine which one is the most important. Now pick it up in verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So a couple of takeaways from that. The first one is this, that Jesus said the greatest commandment for any of us is to love God and to love people. And the second thing that sticks out to me is the Greek word that Jesus used that we translate in English as love. That word is agape. Now, what's interesting is the Greek had several words they would use that we simply translate as the word love in English. They had a word for the type of love that's romantic between a husband and a wife. They had another word for the type of love that exists between a mother and a son or a brother and a sister. But this word, agape, is different because it's not a feeling or something innate we're just born with. Agape is a choice. And agape is a verb. It's something we do. And Jesus calls us to have agape love for one another. In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul is encouraging us in the same vein. In chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. So pause here for a second. We're free is what we're being told. We have the freedom to, to choose what we do, so... What are we going to choose? Who are we going to choose to be? What's important to us? He said we could choose to chase our own worldly fleshly desires or, picking up in verse 13, rather serve one another humbly in love. Once again, agape. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love, agape, your neighbor as yourself. And I'm just telling you, when it comes to relationships of any kind, I'm talking marriage relationships, dating relationships, family relationships, coworkers, neighbors, people you know from church or people you just meet on the street, these relationships will be deeper and more fulfilling if we put our love into action, serving one another. So that's our topic for today, serving and considering one another. And what I want to do is look at a few verses and see if we can all get better at this in our relationships. You know, there are all kinds of verses in the Bible that talk about how we should treat each other. They're often referred to as the one another verses. We're called to love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, help one another, support one another. And Scripture is constantly reminding us that a three-chord strong relationship comes through serving one another. And understand this, serving somebody requires humility. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 tells us, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, obviously, Jesus was our greatest example of this, right? 
We read in Mark chapter 10, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus put others first. He came to serve others. He came to serve us. If anyone who ever lived on this earth should be able to demand more for himself or the best for himself or to get the biggest piece of pie or the best seat or to be the one that holds the remote, it would be Jesus. But that's not what he taught or what he modeled for us. Instead, he said in Matthew chapter 20, the last shall be first and the first last. Once again, consider others more than yourself. To not do that, to not consider others, is to be selfish. And I will tell you that selfishness is the number one thing that destroys relationships. Almost every problem that we see in the world, including the problems in our relationships, comes from selfishness. We want what we want, right? Yet we are called to think more of the other person, to put our love into action and to serve them. And sometimes that could simply mean changing the way we do something or doing something we don't necessarily want to do. I'm about to celebrate my 35th wedding anniversary with my wife, Charlene, which I know must surprise you since I only look like I'm about 40, right? But uh, we met in high school. We dated through her being away in college and got married when I was 22 and she was 21. So even though we had been dating for almost five years, most of that time I was here and she was in Waco. And so I hadn't really learned what it took to be successful in a relationship. Because while she was gone, my life's all about me. I had a job, I was taking classes, I was in a band with some of my buddies, we're playing music, I was playing basketball with my work friends at least twice a week, I'm talking to my buddies about sports on the phone all night, I ate what I wanted, I went where I wanted, I did what I wanted, you feel me, right? And, and, and then I got married. And she began to use a phrase that I heard so many times that I swear it drove me up a wall. Howard, just consider me. Man, I hated that. And it used to make me so angry when she would say it. But eventually, I began to understand my life wasn't just about me any longer. In our relationship, every decision I made affected her too. How we spent our time, how we spent our money, what activities we scheduled. I also began to understand that there were things that I did that drove her crazy. I admit I was a, a pretty messy guy and she would often get stuck cleaning up after me. But the thing that really drove her over the edge was that my dirty socks were always inside out. So, you know, it is you, you pull your sock, the top of it over your heel, and then you throw it in the corner, right? You throw it over there, kind of near where the dirty clothes go. And then she would have to come behind me, my gross inside out sweaty socks, and she'd have to reach in and pull them right side out. And Man, uh, we had one particular consider me conversation that included many angry words and gnashing of teeth, but guess what? I can tell you honestly, in the last 34 years, I've never left a sock inside out. I changed the way I took off my socks. Now I slip them over my heel and then I grab the toes and I start pulling them until they come off and they stay right side out. And while I actually do most of the laundry now, I still take them off that way just in case. She might have to actually touch one. Now, did I change the way I pulled off my socks because I wanted to? No. But when you consider the other person and you value the relationship and you want to serve them, you are willing to change the way you do something. And it may not even seem like a big deal to you, but it is to them. When I was a young man, I was talking with an older married guy at church, and he told me that every night when he got home, he put down his stuff, said hey to the family, then went into the bathroom and shaved. Now, as a guy that's never really enjoyed shaving, I asked why he would do such a thing, and he said that his wife hated his five o'clock shadow and him having rough stubble on his face. So every night, he shaved smooth for her which also meant that he had to wake up each day with a five o'clock shadow. And so if he had a big meeting or a big event that, that day, he would have to shave again in the morning before he went to work. And I asked him, does that irritate you? And he said that while he didn't necessarily like doing it, he did it for her. He said that he had been called to love his wife as he loved himself. He had been called to consider her more than himself. And he said, it's not too much to do. 
to show her how much I value her and how I value our relationship. And so let me ask you, how much would you be willing to change the way you did something to give up your freedom or your preference in consideration of someone else? In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Let me ask you, have you ever been in a relationship, either with a friend or a significant other, where they always got their way? You always did what they wanted. You, you, you always went where they wanted to go. Everything always seemed to be so one-sided. If not, maybe we should take a minute and pray and ask if we're that friend to somebody else. But I love this verse because it says that we show honor when we focus on the other person. And I don't know about you, but I've been guilty of not showing honor in a relationship. You know why? Because it meant doing something that I didn't want to do, and I was just too selfish to do it. And the worst part of this, guys, the worst part of it is that this was super recent. We have a lady on staff here at the church that I absolutely consider a friend. We used to office right down the hall from each other. I would often stop in her office uh, and we would talk. Uh, I'd, I'd, she'd ask about my kids and my family and we talked about her son and the Astros and just life and, and everything. And she's great, man. She is great. And once a month, me and the other pastors and directors are tasked by her department to complete a report. And we're usually given a couple of weeks to do it, and occasionally I get it done in a day or two. But the vast majority of the time, I'm late. Basically, I don't really like taking time and doing the report, and so I put it off and put it off, and I'm generally late. Past the two-week deadline, sometimes, even after I receive the next month's report, I'm a whole month behind. And, and she sends these gentle, almost apologetic reminder emails, and, and they're very sweet, very sweet. And then I always feel guilty, and I apologize, and I promise to send it again soon, many times only to forget it again. Recently, I received the monthly report request and a gentle reminder that I was now two months behind in addition to the one she was sending. Listen to me. She is my friend. But what am I communicating to her about our relationship by taking what is important to her and I'm putting it at the bottom of my priority list? And here I am, guys, I'm preparing a lesson on humility and serving and considering others more important than ourselves. And I'm telling you, it just made me sick to my stomach when I realized, fully realized, what I had been doing to her. It took me maybe only 30 minutes to get all three monthly reports to her. And when I sent them to her, she didn't say, finally, or thanks, loser, or anything like that. You know what she said? She said, you're awesome. Thanks. So tell me, which one of us showed humility? Which one of us considered the other more than themselves? Which one of us is treating our relationship the way Jesus calls us to do? The good news for all of us is that now we know, we know what we have to do to build strong, healthy, three-chord strong relationships. We have to invest our time and our energy in one another. We have to communicate clearly and show respect. We have to strive for peace and healthy resolutions. We have to have good boundaries. We have to show forgiveness and grace. And finally, we have to serve one another in love. We consider the other person more than ourselves, and we look to honor them by embracing the things that are important to them, and we can start that today. It doesn't matter if you've messed it up. It doesn't matter if you've been messing it up for a long time. You repent before the Lord, you apologize to the other person, and you start today building your relationship by conserving and considering one another. I'm so glad you joined me today as we finish up this series. Can, can I pray for us? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the gift of relationship and, and community, God. And we thank you that you have given us guidelines and you have given us things in your word that lead us how to build three chord strong, we could say, relationships. We thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you are doing in us and training us and making us help us, Lord, to open our eyes and see where we are not doing what you have called us to do. 
And then help us have the courage, Lord, to step into that and to do it the right way. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. And it's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. All right, guys, thanks.